Hello and welcome to the special roundtable talk on CGTN where we're going to delve into the highly anticipated 2023 Summer Devils, also known as the Annual Meeting of the World New Champions. I'm Zhong Chunying, live from Tianjin Meijiang Convention Center. Well, in just under 12 hours, this three-day event themed entrepreneurship, a driver of the world economy, is going to kick off. And as we gear up for the event, uh, we have invited the esteemed guests to join in our studio for discussion, who are also the distinguished guests of the forum. So, let me introduce uh, them real quick. We have Mr. Peter Ronalds, who is a partner and head of the consulting group at Oliver Wyman in China. Welcome to our show. Thank you for so, having me. Is this your first time uh, in, in China? Is this your first in, or in Davos? <laughs> it's definitely not my first time in China, and it's not also my first time in Davos. So this is my fourth time in the wow. summer Davos. Uh, so I've been to both uh, Shenzhen and uh, Dalian. Um, and then I come to China a lot with my job, as you can probably imagine, uh, living in Hong Kong. What's different this time? Um, it's just nice to be back. Um, it's been a long time with COVID, obviously the break. Um, everyone's, um, I think, excited to get back and see people in person. Um, so yes. just that ability to sort of spend time together. Um, it hasn't really kicked off yet, but it feels like there's just really interesting themes that are developing post-COVID that we really need to dive into in this meeting. So really look forward What to are it. some of the interesting topics that you look at for it? Yeah, so I mean, I think we're going to see a discussion around innovation. So it's really the theme of the World Definitely. Economic Forum this time. So we'll be talking about that. Um, I think a subset of that will relate to climate. Um, so there's going to be a huge discussion about um, how we can really accelerate the path towards net zero future. Um, we're excited to be part of a discussion around pensions and the reform of the financial system here in China and really how the global players can play into that. Um, and then just more broadly, you know, we all understand the sort of world that we're living in today as we come out from COVID, how does the sort of different geopolitics really evolve over time will obviously be a key so, question. As you just said, there are so many topics, right? So many uh, panel discussions to be expected. Um, but. Let's start with the main theme, right? The entrepreneurship, yep. the driving force of the global economy. What do you make of the slogan first? Why do you think it is so crucial? Um, why do you think the entrepreneurship is so crucial for the world economy right now? Well, I mean, where we are today is you know, clearly one of economic challenge. Um, if you look at the West, especially, um, slowdown in growth rates, challenges related to inflation, um, real questions about sort of how, how economies are going to progress over the next two to three years and what that means for societies. So at the heart, you know, innovation is really a way to drive that economic growth. Um, clearly, the green transition that we were talking about, that's also an important question uh, embedded in that. How do we get the innovation required to make sure that we transition to a net zero world? Um, and then some of the financial innovation around sort of the evolution of different markets and different pieces um, will clearly be interesting as well. And Asia plays a critical role across all of those different pieces. So, you know, it's fascinating to be here and to read, you yeah, know, kind of see what, you, what we discuss. Well, as you just mentioned, Asia is now playing it in more and more an important role in the global economy. And that's definitely one of the major focus point, mm -hmm. focal point in this year's summer, summer doubles, right? The um, recovery of Asian ec economy. So, uh, and the, the IMF earlier have just raised their uh, forecast, economy forecast for in Asian region, right? Uh, because of the rebound of China's economy mm -hmm. and the India economy. What do you make of um, the first future potential uh, of Asian economy in the coming year? What are some of the opportunities you see it ahead? Well, so Asia's critical to global economic growth. So as you say, the IMF estimates that this year, um, two thirds of all the growth is across the world is gonna come from Asia Pacific. Yes, exactly. Uh, within that, 50% um, of that, over 50% of that is China. Um, so all the discussion around sort of Southeast Asia, India, other pieces, which are obviously growing quite quickly, um, you know, China still remains the predominant force behind sort of the driving growth there. Um, so, you know, it's critical for the world uh, overall that, that essentially, you know, we're able to get the Asian economies back on track um, and really kind of growing. You also see this really interesting situation of much lower inflation here than you have in other economies. So perhaps less need for, um, you know, sort of fiscal policy to come in or, uh, and, and really think about kind of what things look like. And monetary policy obviously here has been you know, a little bit less 
um, aggressive than it's had to be in various different other places. So, um, yeah, I mean, we see lots of scope for Asian growth. I think we, we, we share the sort of view that the IMF has that this is really the engine of global growth over the next you know, two to three years. Um, and so clearly these meetings become all the more important. You know, by, by and talking time. about uh, Asia's role in the global economy, um, we know that Asia's economy is very highly uh, integrated in the global supply mm. chain and trade is playing a very important role as a driving force of the whole uh, Asia's economy. Right? There are some uh, very interesting figures. Uh, last year, some emerging economies in East Asia account for over 17% of the global trade in goods and services yep. uh, total. So, um, and over the past few years, we've ni witnessed many policies to lower uh, the trade barriers, mm -hmm. uh, to foster the cooperate, trade cooperations among countries, for example, ASEAN, for example, CPTPP, uh, RCEP agreements, and so on and so forth. So what do you make of the significance uh, of the trade collaborations between among countries? in the general context of the uh, economic development. I mean, they're highly significant, right? Um, so it's interesting to us that now really two of the big three global trade agreements, as you mentioned, are now ASEAN-focused or Asia-focused. Um, and so to us, that, that you know, sort of just shows, I think, an evolution of um, the importance of trade within the region um, becoming much, much more critical uh, to the entire kind of growth that we see. And you see that sort of connectivity between China and Southeast Asia, connectivity between you know, India and Southeast Asia, um, Japan continuing to have a substantial amount of foreign direct investment, which is really focused again on those markets. You know, all of this sort of shows us that you know, kind of the engine of growth is no longer just developing exports and selling them to the West. It's actually now developing products and services that essentially sell across, across Asia. And that market itself becomes really, really important for you know, kind of all of our clients as we speak to them here. Uh, and when it comes to trade collaborations, hmm. um, China's Belt and Road Initiative is, is one of um, the examples of promoting trade, of promoting trade ties among countries. Uh, what, what do you make of um, the role that the Belt and Road Initiative plays in promoting trade in Asian countries? Well, so I think it's important, right? It's an important piece of the architecture that's being essentially developed as we speak uh, in terms of sort of what the international structures look like. Clearly, there's been a lot of emphasis on sovereign debt, um, and you know, kind of one of the risk factors, which I'm sure might come up in subsequent discussion, is is sort of how those sovereign debt plays out. Um, we see encouraging signs about the resolution of some of those sovereign debts. It looks like there is consensus in terms of what that looks like, uh, and that wasn't necessarily the case, you know, three or four months ago. And so, you know, I think Belt and Road plays a critical role in sort of developing the infrastructure, developing effectively the relationship between China and various different other countries. And clearly there's a two-way street there, right? Especially if we think about commodities and other things that are required for, you know, new sectors like, uh, you know, EVs and other things like that. You know, the batteries that require the, the sort of raw earth materials, you know, effectively it's clear that there's quite a lot of alignment of, of, of Belt and Road for that. So, sure, those trade corridors become really important, but I, you know, I think it's more... The, the realistically, the, there's only so much you can do with sort of a Belt and Road policy. There's a lot you can do really with effectively a private sector kind of jumping in. So a lot of opportunities ahead. But, but after, after all, we've talked so much about opportunities, uh, mm. positive sides, advantages. Uh, there are also, of course, challenges, right? Um, the IMF also warned of the risk from persistent inflation and global market volatility driven by the trouble in Western banking sector as well. Um, so what's your assessment of the financial risks in Asian economies given the recent uh, banking turmoil in the United States and also in, in Europe? Yeah, I mean, I, so I think the near-term near -term view, we're, we're perhaps not super concerned, right? If you look at what really drove US banking challenges over the last you know, year or two, it's really been interest rates. So how do banks really manage interest rates? How do they think through um, you know, essentially um, core asset liability management? And what do the interest rate changes mean for um, the cost of borrowing that, that the various different consumers, uh, be that um, you know, SMEs, you know, mortgage, mortgage owners, or, or other people have face? So, so I think that that piece clearly is less relevant here, given that we don't face the same inflationary environment. So we don't think the banks sort of suffer that first order sort of challenges in quite the same way. Where I think it could play through in terms of real issues is, 
you know, if you see some of the sort of warning signals that we're seeing in the West and in the US, especially around commercial real estate, if those play them through into a real full-fledged economic challenge in you know, the US and Europe, then clearly, you know, sort of the demand for various different goods that are produced here uh, will, will, will fall. And, and, and so that demand sort of transitioning its way through into the economies in Southeast Asia and here in China, you know, clearly that is potentially a challenge going forward. So I don't see sort of the first degree banking challenge, but really that second order, if there is a macroeconomic slowdown that's more acute than we think it is, notwithstanding the question around south-south trade that we were talking about before, you know, you could see, see a slowdown here. But... What are some of the measures that you can think of to mitigate the risk, to, to address the challenges that you just mentioned? Yeah, I mean, I think realistically what's happening across Asia, but certainly here in China, is essentially a build out of sort of the domestic um, economy demand, right? So China's now a big consumption demand as well as both being a manufacturing hub and Southeast Asia is fast following it as well. I mean, if you look at some of our auto manufacturing clients, if you go down, I was in Malaysia last week, you know, one out of every, whatever it is, 10 cars is a Chinese manufactured vehicle now. And so starting to really think about that sort of positioning, uh, where essentially we see the demand coming from Asia, building in Asia for Asia, you know, that's obviously the key mitigant that you can, you can put in place or that people are trying to put in place as it stands. And, and clearly China's been a, a perfect example of that, right? The transition to real consumption here, uh, driving the economic growth is key. And also another major f uh, factor that's... Uh, affecting the Asian eco economic recovery is, of course, China-U.S. relations. Hmm. Um, given the fact that the reason is so, as I just mentioned, is so integrated uh, in the global supply chain. And also, the region has very significant uh, trade exposure to both um, economies. Yep. Um, so, although that many U.S. business executives come to visit China this year, yep. uh, but there are still fears about the potential so-called uh, potential prospect of so-called decoupling mm -hmm. uh, between the world's two largest economies. What's your point of view in regards to that? And how do you think will China-U.S. tensions uh, impact on Asian economy? I think it's a, it's a very important question. Um, it's a difficult one to have a real crystal ball to answer. But I think our view and what we've been advising our clients is it's really sector-specific. So as you think about some of the more sensitive sectors, you, know, you really already see perhaps in the microchip space and other types of semiconductors, you start to see a real you know, sort of dislocation of the different pieces of the economy. But as you move into sort of the vast majority of goods and services, be that you know, kind of automobile production, large industrial production, and even services, you, know, you see a real you know, kind of, I think, ongoing push towards globalization. So, so we think it's really sector by sector. And at the moment, it's been relatively constrained in terms of which sectors get most impacted. So you know, I think, you know, kind of as you look across the various different options, you know, that, that I think is key. And, you know, sort of I think the vast majority remains still pretty globally interconnected. Um, you know, if you look at the balance, you know, if you look at the trade, trade between the U.S. and China, you know, in 2022 was the highest it's ever been. Yes. And so you start to sort of see that actually unpicking that becomes very, very difficult. What about long term? When it comes to long term, do you think it's still... The case, that's still the case? It's very hard to tell, isn't it, I guess. Um, but I, I think probably. Um, it's very, very difficult to see it decoupling. I yeah. think you probably see a move towards more Asia to China kind of trade going on. Um, and a little bit welcome. And a little bit, um, a little bit less, um, you know, sort of, sort of the usual US-China kind of piece. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it'll stay pretty well integrated. Thanks for your insights. And we're, uh, we're very glad to join uh, in the studio with another guest who is Wan Zhu, the professor from Beijing Normal University. And she's also a researcher of Belt and Road Initiative. Welcome to our show. Hi. Uh, hi. We've just talked so much about uh, the opportunities uh, and also challenges ahead when it comes to Asian uh, economic recovery. Uh, you are an, an expert on Belt and Road Initiative. Tell us something about your expertise. Um, what, more, what are some of the opportunities that Belt and Road Initiative has to offer? I think uh, the Belt and Road uh, 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 Initiative is very important, not only for China, but also for Asian and the whole world. Because it is a very big platform and um, it promotes the uh, spirit of cooperate. I think the uh, cooperation spirit is now the uh, most significant thing for all human beings. 
And since the past three years, yeah, we've met the so-called grand pandemic, and now we are all in the recovery of economics. But I think the manufacturing data shows that even uh, countries like Japan, Korea, South Korea, and Germany, yeah, they have very weak manufacturing data, and also export uh, are also very weak. So I think cooperation now is very, very important. I think the Belt and Road Initiative now uh, promotes this spirit and uh, let us yeah, cooperate and do something more together, just like the uh, World Economic Forum. Yeah, this summit yeah, also gather us together to um, discuss about a lot of issues, a lot of problems, and so that we can find some solutions. Yeah. Well, earlier we just talked about some of the challenges, potential challenges and risks coming from outside world, um, especially the banking turmoil from the western part of the world, uh, from the U.S. and Europe. Do you think, uh, what's your assessment of the risk, what kind of impact do you see um, those uncertainties from the western world could have on Belt and Road Initiative and also on Asian economy? Uh, I think we all see, or I'd say we all, uh, we are also worried about the upcoming crisis, yeah, the economic crisis or the financial crisis, yeah, uh, we are also worried about that. And talking about that, I want to talk about some uh, interesting things, because this is not the first time I come to the Summer Summit of Davos. And last time I came to the summit, was in 2019, yeah. And the most funnest, yeah, the funnest part of this is that when I feel something about the last time I attended the summit, uh, it was just like uh, the last year in the last year. And meanwhile, I also feel that it was just like decades ago. <laughs> yeah, because I think a lot of things have been changed, yeah, in past three, four years. Yeah, I can recall that in 2019, yeah, we also uh, were so worried about a lot of problems and issues in the whole world, uh, including Belt and Road Initiative issues. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I think I also attended one session, yeah, talking about ecology, biological things like that. And many people there, they were so worried about what you can guess, yeah. They were so worried that many governments were trying to cut budget of environment protection. And why? It's not uh, hard to understand that because the president of the United States at the time was Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the problem at the time was that and no one at the time expected that uh, Joe Biden would be the next president of the United States and so the ecology rules, yeah, some things, standards, and some other things have been changed yeah, in the opposite way. And so uh, in 2019 at the time, when we talk about the economic prospect, yeah, we were so worried about the crisis upcoming, but in another way. At the time, the rate was very low. Yeah, it's at the floor, just mm -hmm. like, yeah, many rates in some countries were just below zero yeah, at the time. And the, uh, and the inflation was also very low. And the economists at the time were worried about why, yeah, this yeah, could how happen. Do we get, yeah, how do we get inflation back? In yeah, the, uh, why this could happen? And mm -hmm. nowadays, yeah, no one expects that. Nowadays, yeah, yeah. we have very hiking yeah, risk of a very high rate and very high inflation. So I think uh, sometimes we, we are talking about a lot of problems, mm -hmm. but sometimes when we don't have enough solutions for the problems, the problems disappear. Yeah, because they have been changed. Oh, that's so philosophical. Yeah. <laughs> that's philosophical. I, I was here in 2019 yeah. as well, and I remember, mm -hmm. I, you're right, it's good to sort of step back a little bit. I remember the low rate environment being yeah. what I was concerned about. Uh -huh. I, and I also remember climate, and I think climate remains a challenge, as we were saying earlier. Mm -hmm. But it is amazing how much progress has been made in those yeah. four years. If you of think course. about net zero commitments, if you think about what the corporate universe is doing in terms of their capability to transition, some of the technologies that have come online that were really early days when we were back here, yeah. the fact not here in 2019, mm -hmm. um, you know, now suddenly are, are you know, kind of real and live. So mm -hmm. like, it's exciting for us to see 
you know, sort of the development, it's good to sort of step back sometimes and see the progress that's been made as well. Yeah. Mm. So there's always reason to look forward yeah, exactly. <laughs> to, to, ha to have hope and faith and <laughs> to be positive and confident about the future. Although hopefully we go back hope. to annual rather than, yeah. rather than not annual, <laughs> given <laughs> exactly. the, uh, in the next to the next. And talking about confidence, we've, we've talked so much about the confidence and opportunities when it comes to uh, Asian economic recovery. Um, though we, we're not sure yet what's going to happen in like years to come, but it's it's good to be confident, and there are reasons for us to, con to, to convincing reasons for us to be um, optimistic about the Asian economy. But there's another challenge that's coming out of that because we know that uh, with the higher output, higher consumption from Asian market, it's also going to mean the growing carbon emissions, uh, mm -hmm. which is contradicted to. Um, the 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 general uh, the overall uh, ambition of um, carbon reduction now. So what what do you think? Is, how how can Asian countries balance uh, the economic development and its carbon emission goal? Let's start with you, Professor Wan. Uh, how how is the Belt and Road Initiative uh, working on this? Yeah, oh, we've been working on this yeah, for a long time, yeah, and uh, we did a lot of jobs. I think we've contributed mm -hmm. a lot yeah, with, with confidence, right? <laughs> uh, we contributed a lot to the, um, we'd say, the uh, green yeah, Silk Road. Yep. Yeah, um, and I think uh, we devoted a lot of uh, things and uh, invested, yeah, like green investment, yeah, we also had some green investment uh, agreement with uh, a lot of countries. We also um, uh, did some education lectures for uh, several, I think, uh, 28 countries. Yeah, for their uh, people to uh, to to know something about how to do green, yeah, mm -hmm. economic growth. I think um, the Belt and Road Initiative is uh, also about the green because. Green is not only about the carbon, yeah. It's also about the ESG, yeah. yeah. It's also about how to help people, especially some people in developing countries. Maybe they're in very uh, in, in poverty, yeah, in very poor situations. How to help them? So I think we did a lot of things to do the green stuff to help the uh, Belt and Road countries uh, to do so. Looking ahead into the future, is is there any specific goals or uh, that you would like to achieve in this regard when it comes to green development? Uh, I think green develop uh, development. Uh, one uh, important thing we do about the green development is about the uh, technologies. Yeah, we now have something uh, very specific, and I think we have some. Uh, development uh, technologies in this area and we also export those things to a lot of countries yeah um, I think this is one thing we can do and another thing is uh, what I call this uh, something like ecology and ESG yeah, it's about the corporations how to help uh, poor people in all those developing countries yeah, um, and, and I think uh, the infrastructures building also help people, yeah, some people in poverty, and they can uh, have better um, economic growth. Also, they can have better employment, and that's very important for them, yeah. And one question to Peter as well. Mm. Um, I think putting Asian economies onto the path of sustainable development, green development, requires a huge, a significant shift of investment, of course. Uh, you, you are an, also an expert on uh, financial sector. What do you make of the role that the financial sector play in this overall green transformation? I, mean, I think it's becoming more and more significant, right? I, I think you can't, you probably can't generalize across Asia, um, because if you look at China as an example, with the sort of population and demographics sort of playing their way through, plus the very fast electrification of various different things like vehicles and other pieces, sort of next generation of power, you're actually seeing a relatively quick decarbonization. So both the per capita number coming down and the number of people coming down, obviously that accelerates things. 
you know, if you look at a Japan and Korea relatively advanced in terms of sort of, you know, kind of how they're thinking about net zero transition. If we move to Southeast Asia, though, that's really where, you know, I think some of the bigger challenges are. And certainly if you look at India, you know, kind of how do we finance effectively that transition? And I think it's sort of a, as you say, it's sort of a green development question. It's sort of how do we essentially make sure that that economic development sort of leapfrogs the carbon intensive period and gets immediately to a green situation. And that's going to require financing of very substantial magnitude, but also essentially the right incentives to make sure that you know, kind of we move immediately to that. And you know, the banks play a substantial role in that. The multilateral development banks play a huge role in that. AIIB has obviously been one of the key players in thinking about this. Um, but the World Bank and various different other folks are also out there to really make sure that the incentives are there to make sure the development happens, but make sure that it happens in a green way. And then I think the private sector comes in behind. Then do you think there are opportunities in area, um, rooms for co cooperation be among countries in this regard? Absolutely, yeah. And if you look at sort of all the discussion that's happening in the multilateral development bank space, as an example, it's really the forum where these countries come together and think about you know, kind of how should we be helping development, but also how should we make sure that that aligns with what we need from a carbon perspective. So yes, absolutely, and you know, China plays a key role in that. So globalize, we're still, uh, there's still <laughs> reason for us to live in a globalization. Climate change era. is a global problem, isn't it? So yeah, yeah it needs a global solution. Yes, uh, and also financial sector it has a role to play in Belt and Road Initiative, right? Is yeah, I, I think we can do a lot of things to help people yeah, in financial area. Sometimes we just failed, uh, and in the past we felt financial things is only for rich people, yeah. But now we all know, yeah, we did a lot of research in the financial inclusion yeah, area. That means you can make more people physically approach to uh, financial instruments and services so that yeah, the financial services can cover uh, more and more people, yeah, even like uh, we say poor people, yeah, normal people, I'd say. Um, and uh, then I want to say that we also did some research in the area of uh, financial literacy. Yeah, I'd say the financial uh, inclusion means physically approach to services of finance. Mm -hmm. And uh, financial literacy, uh, I'd say, uh, means the mentally yeah, approach to uh, financial services because we found that uh, a lot of people, yeah, due to the um, technology progress, they can use mobile phones and some laptops through internet and they can uh, approach, yeah, uh, financial services um, easily, yeah, but they just don't know how to, yeah, how to use them, yep. yeah. They don't know what the services mean, yeah, this debt and that loan, yeah, what green loan is, yeah, they just don't know that. Yeah, people in, uh, including in China and also in other countries, including India mm -hmm. and South Africa, yeah, in those countries, many people, they just don't know. Have no, have, have no idea. Have no idea. Well, well, what no does that mean? That. Yeah, and when they don't know what that means, they just don't want to get that surface. Even they can benefit from it. But how, how do you achieve that? How, how do you... Yeah, how do you educate people to improve that financial? Uh, yeah, benefit? that's the most important and the most interesting thing. And we had some research and, and had some teams, yeah, also with uh, corporate, with the, uh, the, 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 the Davos, yeah, the mm -hmm. uh, World Economic Forum, yeah. And sometimes they just did some very amazing work, yeah, to educate people, like in. Uh, like South project. Africa, oh. yeah, using some uh, techniques mm -hmm. and some apps and also some uh, training lessons, yeah, to tell people, to, to tell normal people, yeah. To make finance more accessible. Yeah, so. accessible and to uh, let them know they can use what to help them more. That is very important because mentally sometimes they just think, no, this is not good because I don't know that very well. So this is also a very interesting thing. Yeah, mm. It's two sides, right? You have mm. the education side and then you have the regulatory side. Yeah. And so managing those two in concert together mm. such that people don't get sold products that yeah. eventually are inappropriate to them, mm. but at the same time that they are understanding of what exactly yeah. is being sold mm. to them is key. And we've done a lot of work in 
in sort of the education space as well, really helping sort of even people at secondary school or primary school understand exactly. the basics of financial. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that then works its way through the system. Hopefully, hopefully more and more people could take advantage of finance and uh, to uh, make their life better and better. Of course. Well, so thanks for your time and Thank insights. You. Really appreciate it. And Thank you. Uh, well, that will do it for this edition of Roundtable Talk with CGTN. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.